In this lecture, we will be diving into Jewish legal tradition, Talmudic law, and Islamic legal tradition. Talmudic and Islamic law show many parallels. They have similar starting points in their underlying concepts. They are structured in similar ways. They are based on similar systems of sources of law, and they share a number of similar sets of rules. In addition, to some extent, they also face similar challenges in their confrontation with modernity. It therefore makes sense to study Talmudic and Islamic law in parallel and to compare them at every step of the analysis. They both are fascinating legal worlds emerging from brilliant civilizations that have greatly contributed to the development of European civilization and undoubtedly have still much to offer. Judaism and Islam also share a long history of peaceful coexistence and fruitful interaction and cultural exchange. Perhaps the best illustration are the centuries during which both cultures flourished side by side in Spain. For around eight centuries, Islam and Judaism shaped medieval Spain. For the Arabs, Spain was Al-Andalus. For the Jews, Sephirat. It all began with the Arab conquests of the 7th and 8th centuries. In 711, Arab and North African troops crossed the Strait of Gibraltar under the command of Tariq ibn Ziyad, initiating the conquest of Spain, which became part of the Islamic world, ruled by the Umayyad caliphs from Damascus. This is where Gibraltar comes from. The Arabs named the mountain that dominates the strait Jebel al-Tariq, which later developed into Gibraltar. Following the conquest, Spain, al-Andalus, developed into an emirate and later an independent caliphate with Cordoba as its capital city. Cordoba became one of the biggest cities of the world and by far the biggest city in Europe. It was the political, economic and cultural heart of Al-Andalus and it was famous throughout the Islamic world and beyond as a center of learning with dozens of libraries and institutions of higher education. In the Middle Ages, science was much more advanced in the Islamic world than in Christian Europe. Cordoba's great mosque dates back to this time. As you can see on the picture, it still marks the center of the city, even though it has been turned into a Catholic cathedral in the meantime. But Cordoba's great mosque is still admired as one of the masterpieces of Islamic architecture. Here you can feel the delicacy of Moorish art, the art of Islamic Spain. Another great center of learning and culture was Toledo, which became a focal point of cultural exchange between Muslim, Jewish and Christian scholars. Like other cities in Spain, Toledo had a vibrant Jewish community. On the picture you can see a Toledo synagogue in Moorish style with Hebrew calligraphic inscriptions on the wall. This is another view of the same synagogue. Here you have the niche where the Torah scrolls used to be kept. And this is another Toledo synagogue, again in a style reminiscent of Islamic mosque architecture. Later, when it was already recaptured by Christian rulers coming from the north of Spain, Toledo became famous for its school of translators. Many scientific and philosophical works representing the high levels of knowledge in the Islamic world were translated from Arabic into Latin or other European languages at that time. One prominent example is Avicenna's Canon of Medicine. Ibn Sina, or Avicenna in the Latinized version of his name, was a Persian physician, scientist, mathematician, philosopher, poet, and jurist. His Canon of Medicine, a five-volume medical encyclopedia, was translated into Latin in Toledo. And in its Latin edition, it remained the standard medical textbook in Europe up to the 18th century. 
In early 11th century, the caliphate of Cordoba declined and eventually collapsed. It split into a multitude of independent principalities, the so-called taifas, bigger and smaller, around 33 of them. The taifas rivaled and attacked each other almost constantly in a never-ending struggle for supremacy and survival. In the following decades, Seville emerged as the most powerful among the taifas, succeeding in considerably expanding its dominion at the expense of rival taifas. Seville developed into a thriving metropolis. On the right-hand side of the slide, you can see the famous minaret of the city's great mosque. Rivalries between the taifas greatly facilitated the process we call Reconquista, the gradual reconquest of Spain by the Christian kingdoms of the north, a process spanning over several centuries. Toledo was reconquered early on in the year 1085. Seville resisted until the middle of the 13th century before being conquered by Christian rulers in 1248. The new Christian rulers replaced the great mosque with the cathedral and, as you can see on the picture, transformed the minaret into the cathedral's bell tower, thus signaling the beginning of a new era. The last Muslim principality to remain on Spanish soil until the end of the 15th century was Granada. On the picture, you can see the Alhambra, the magnificent palace of the emirs of Granada. It's another masterpiece of Moorish architecture, marking a last display of splendor in what was left of Al-Andalus. 1492 was a watershed year in Spanish history. Not only was it the year when Christopher Columbus discovered America on a mission he conducted for the Spanish monarchs, it was also the year when King Ferdinand of Aragon and Queen Isabella of Castile conquered Granada, bringing the Reconquista to a close and eliminating the last bastion of Muslim rule in Spain. The Treaty of Granada, with which the Emir surrendered, contained guarantees for the Muslim population who were allowed to remain in the country and continue to freely practice their religion. Even though those guarantees were strictly implemented for some years, they did not last. But the first victims of the new political situation with the Reconquista completed were the Jews. In the same year, 1492, Jews all over Spain were faced with the choice of either adopting the Catholic faith or leaving the country. A few years later, the Muslims were to share the same fate. In an early nation-building process, Spain had to be purified from what were perceived as foreign elements. This is in stark contrast to the centuries before. The time from the early 8th century up to the late 15th century had not been without its periods of political turmoil and its incidents of religious fanatism. But for the most part, it had been a time of peaceful coexistence and fruitful cultural exchange between Muslims, Jews and Christians. The new politics of religion, which only allowed for Catholicism on Spanish soil, led to an exodus of Jews and, a little later, of Muslims as well. As you can see on the map, the main destination of fleeing Spanish Jews was the Ottoman Empire, where Sultan Bayezid II expressly welcomed them, even going so far as to dispatch his navy to bring them safely to Istanbul, Izmir, Salonika, or places under Ottoman rule in the Middle East or North Africa. Other Jewish people fled to Portugal and, when being expelled from there as well some years later, emigrated further to Amsterdam, Hamburg and other places in Northern Europe. As a result, new centers of Jewish population and culture developed in Salonika, today's Greek Thessaloniki, and other cities of the Ottoman Empire. 
for example, Cairo, and also in Northern Europe, for example, in Amsterdam. Although now far from Spain, the Spanish Jews continued their Sephardic traditions, and the Sephardim still form one of the two main branches of Judaism. The other main branch are the Ashkenazim, the Jewish communities that have their roots in Central and Eastern Europe, with important centers, for example, in Krakow, and in Vilnius, which due to its large Jewish population and cultural significance used to be referred to as the Jerusalem of the North. Both branches have also their own language traditions. Ladino, an old version of Spanish enriched with Hebrew expressions for the Sephardim, and Yiddish, a combination of medieval German and Hebrew elements for the Ashkenazim. And these are just two main currents of Judaism. Taking a closer look, we can discover much more diversity within Judaism. With just around 13 and a half million people worldwide, Judaism is the smallest among the world religions in terms of numbers. But this does not impair its cultural richness. And Jewish communities are present all around the world. The Islamic world also presents a great diversity. Islam's spread over the whole middle belt of the old world, Europe, Africa and Asia, developing a wealth of regional and local traditions in the process. Today, the overall Muslim population is close to 2 billion worldwide, which is more than 24% of the world population. At this point, let me try to give you a sense of the diversity of the Islamic world. Controlling and deeply marking the entire middle belt of the European, African and Asian land masses, and also establishing long-standing communities of Muslim merchants, craftsmen and scholars as far as in China, Islam was the dominant civilization of the world for centuries. No wonder it produced a broad variety of different styles of Islam. And we can feel this diversity when we look at examples of architecture from different parts of the Islamic world. Let me present a quiz to you. Try to guess where in the Islamic world the buildings in the following pictures are to be found. Isn't this an interesting building in the middle of that courtyard? Where is it? And what about this very different courtyard? Where could it be? And this, it's again quite different in style, isn't it? Isn't this a color that makes you dream? And wouldn't you continue dreaming here? Is this Islamic at all? Looking at the calligraphy bottom left on the picture, it probably is. Is this architecture or gold smithing? But this gate pointing to the skies with its twin towers is certainly no less marvelous. From blue to red, we seem to be in a different world here but it still looks undoubtedly Islamic. And this is again another world. But this is even more so. Isn't this amazing? And what do you think of this beautiful ceramic wall decoration covered all over with elegant calligraphy? Doesn't this one look exotic? And where could this vast geometrically designed complex of buildings be? And finally, we have also this landmark building that is difficult to overlook when you are moving around in the city where it is located. So where is all of this? I invite you to take a couple of minutes to try to sort it out and then move on to part two.